Thank you. I'm here to talk about transportation. We humans, we love our transportation. It helps us to get around, to move around, brings us the things that enrich our lives, be they from across town or from the other part of the world. They even allow great events like this to come together. In fact, we love our transportation so much that we use it to the point of congestion. As you all know, traffic gets jammed, ports are clogged, airports struggle to keep up with capacity, and that's just today. We all know that our transportation needs are gonna to continue to grow and grow. And let's think about everything transportation does for us. Transportation unlocks human potential. It drives commerce, grows GDP, and enables shared prosperity. And here we find ourselves often constrained by it. But isn't this the 21st century? Isn't this when everything is rad because we make it rad? I think it is. I'm here to talk about Hyperloop. So if you don't know, Hyperloop is an integrated infrastructure transportation system. What that means, it's the whole kit and caboodle. What we're talking about is literally building a tube full length between any two points. Then we control the environment in that tube, which is to say we reduce most of the air pressure. And then we have a vehicle that we accelerate with non-contact or electric propulsion. It discrete segments. Because we've reduced the air pressure so much, there's very little drag, and we can accelerate this vehicle, and it can coast for long periods of time. So we have a very low energy solution. In addition, on that pod, we often choose to put a compressor, which reduces the friction even more. So now we have a very low energy in integrated transportation system. And I want to point out there's, there's two tubes, one in each direction. So now we can send things extremely quickly, very low energy, extremely safe, and we think at very low cost. And then you add other advantages of autonomous vehicles and being in incredibly weatherproof. And we think this is a really great system. As you may know, Hyperloop was first proposed by Elon Musk. He published an open source white paper back in 2013. We actually did a, re a bunch of research on the history of tube-based transportation ideas, because many came before this. But the system-level architecture that, that Elon came up with is really brilliant. We liked it so much, in fact, that we started a company around it. So we believe we can really take this system-level architecture and deliver real value. So what we did is we, we took that and we started from scratch with a clean sheet of paper with this idea. So at this point, it's best of you sort of eliminate what you think you knew about Hyperloop, and we'll tell you about what we're going to do, because we think we can deliver real value with it. In addition to carrying passengers, we're really looking at carrying cargo. This is a fantastic opportunity for us to help out the world, we think. So we started with the idea of the size and mass of a full-size cargo container and setting that in our vehicle, and we started our engineering there. Now, of course, we also want to move passengers. We're going to move them in a very smooth and convenient way, and also, it's an on-demand experience. So as we kind of packetize the smaller groups of people that we send, then you don't miss the 3 o'clock train or plane and have to catch the 4.30. Whenever you get to the station, it departs. We can fully utilize it, and it goes direct to destination. And we really like the way that this integrates with the, with the landscape. The use of elevated pylons is really a way to smooth out the verticality of it, because if we want to go fast, we need to go really straight. So using the pylons is an opportunity to vertically smooth a route, but it also means we're unrestrictive of right of way, which we really, really like. And we're really looking at underwater routes as well. So if all this sounds great, if it sounds fantastic, what is it that you guys need to know about Hyperloop today? Well, it's real and it's happening. That's what I'm going to tell you. So I want to point out as we transition from drawings to pictures of real physical hardware. Because right now we are doing the hardcore engineering work to deliver all of these technologies. We've got a great team and we're really bringing this to fruition. We're building hardware, 
And when we have to, we're inventing not only the technology itself, but the technologies we need to develop the technologies. Here we have a picture of our levitation, levitation test rig on the left that we custom engineered and a custom wind tunnel on the right that lets us test not only our compressor blades, but also the full aerodynamics of the system. So we've designed and built these ourselves. We're doing the hardcore component level work right now. And as we develop the components that are going to come together, we're going to run a full speed, full scale, full system test. So we're talking about a pod, a tube with very low pressure air. We're going to have a pod with a compressor on it. We're going to have linear electric motor. We're going to have our levitation system. And we're going to have the full system test. And we hope to run that by the end of the year. And oh yeah, this is really happening too. These are some of our first tubes that have been delivered out in North Las Vegas, Nevada. So. <laughs> and it's fun, yeah, it's so fun. It, it's really a fantastic opportunity. And, and this, this first full system test we have we're really pushing for is, is our Kitty Hawk moment. Uh, and that's an important word for us because Kitty Hawk, this picture was taken the, the Wright brothers in 1903 in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, and it's widely regarded as the, the fathers of, of powered controlled flight. It should be noted that other people created heavier than air flying machines before the Wright brothers did, but they, they were innovators. They really developed a control system to both lift off and control the plane during flight. So, so innovation is really at the core of everything. It, innovation is an idea, plus using all the tools and technologies you have available in that day and executing it. So you have idea, tools and technology and execute it. And, and they did this better to perfection. Most people don't know that they actually designed and built their own wind tunnel to test different airflow shapes at different flow speeds. So that's what we're seeing here, a replica of that wind tunnel. So they did this innovation work at an engineering level that helped them develop what we know today. And I do like to point out that I think we stand on the shoulders of great innovation in every form of transportation, if especially look at that, that old rail picture there. I mean, they had to develop not only the rail, but the tools to build the rail. And, and this has been happening for hundreds of years, and I think we're going to make it happen. But I want to tell you a little bit about how I came to know innovation myself. Here's a picture of me pre-mustache. <laughs> I was uh, lucky enough to be a very early team member at SpaceX, uh, and I, I really learned firsthand the power of a truly bold vision and a great team behind it. Uh, and SpaceX innovated so deeply, and, we, and it, it, just to uh, imagine that in 10 years, SpaceX went from a clean sheet of paper to designing and building its own rocket, to designing and building its own spaceship that they launched into orbit with that rocket, and then that spaceship docked with the International Space Station. So a very impressive feat, and all done with some hardcore and innovation, which is using you know, the big idea and then all the tools and technology of today and executing it. But I want to point out that the big idea isn't to get to orbit or to get to the space station, because these things had been done. But the drive of SpaceX was to dramatically lower the cost to orbit and really enable things that weren't enabled before. And this is, continues with their recent landing of the first stage after delivering payload to orbit. So the real push of SpaceX is lower costs. And at Hyperloop, that's our goal, too. I can tell you for sure that designing and building a Hyperloop is a lot easier than designing and building a spaceship that docks with the space station. The core idea to delivering value is to do it at a scale, at a, at a commercial scale, uh, that's going to be accessible and really deliver all the value. So, that, so that's really what we're trying to do, is to bring value to the equation with innovation. So the question is not if Hyperloop will work. The question is when will Hyperloop work? And then, and then you get to have some fun now with this, is when you say, when Hyperloop works, what does that mean? What does a world mean when you have a new mode of transportation that's additive to all the others? You're not only moving quickly and, and shrinking distance, but you're shrinking time. You can imagine people living in one city, working in another. You have workforce mobility is enabled. You have people have access to their families. You know, and look at the way it integrates with the landscape. We do feel that's a really nice opportunity here. So fast, safe, low cost, and energy elegant transportation we think is coming in the 21st century. And the passenger experience 
is very important. It's extremely smooth because we control all the knobs. Once we've built this integrated system, we can control it. If we need to go around a sharp curve, we slow down. So we are absolutely dog friendly, grandma friendly, child friendly. <laughs> You know, this is absolutely an elevator experience. Ding, you've arrived. And in fact, if these people here that you see had loaded in a station in downtown Stockton when I'd started talking, they'd have already arrived in downtown Sacramento and probably be on their way walking to the station now. And of course, the $64,000 question is, yes, there will be a bathroom. So let's think about what it means for a region. It's not just meeting existing demand. Here's sort of a fictitious route between Los Angeles and Las Vegas. But Hyperloop could deliver this in about 30 minutes. So it's not about meeting an existing demand of people that are already traveling. It's about enabling changed behaviors. And this is what every form of transportation has done. So now you have a region that becomes really a distributed city. People can live anywhere, work anywhere. Another opportunity is, is how you can utilize big public infrastructure. Imagine an idea where you could have one mega airport serving an entire region that now have instant access to it. Another opportunity would be to distributize your airport and use existing infrastructure. If you can imagine London where you have Heathrow, Gatwick, Stansted, all serving partial, but if they were each terminals of the same airport, it changes the way people live and work and move. And this is the bigger vision of Hyperloop. Obviously, we think cargo is a big opportunity, and we think the natural integration with the last mile is a great way for Hyperloop to get cargo out of cities, to get some of these trucks off the road. Naturally integrates, and, and, and really a core ethos of, of what we're trying to do with this technology. Here's a port. This is actually the port of Marseille in the south of France. And obviously, ports like this were built where the cities were, but in today's world, maybe we could rethink the landscape. What if, with Hyperloop, we could take this port in the south of France and turn it back into the south of France? These are just some of the ideas that we think Hyperloop is going to offer, and we're really excited about it. The idea of this near-fantastical tube-based transportation has been in our minds for generations. It's been in the way we tell stories. But the technology is finally here. The time is finally now, and we are now building Hyperloop, coming fast and coming soon. Thank you.